Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the Thames Valley. Topshop and its former owner Arcadia have been fined a million pounds following the death of a schoolboy at a store in Reading. Caden's parents say nothing will make up for their loss. You probably wouldn't have found a happier little boy. He gave the best hugs you could ever imagine. The research at Oxford University into why women are twice as likely to suffer from asthma than men. Also tonight, we meet three-year-old Rudy and his mum, who are getting ready to join thousands of others taking part in this weekend's Great South Run. And I'm on the trail for the best autumn colours at a spectacular hotspot here in Hampshire. Good evening. Topshop and its former owner Arcadia have been fined a combined total of £1 million following the death of a schoolboy at a Topshop store in Reading. Ten-year-old Caden Reddick died after a queue barrier at the former shop in the Oracle Centre fell on his head five years ago. Both companies were found guilty of health and safety failures leading to Caden's death. We can go live to Natalie Verney, who is at Reading Crown Court for us tonight. Natalie, this has been a long journey to justice for the family, hasn't it? Yes, a long and painful journey, made even longer, of course, because of the court delays due to COVID. Caden died in 2017. It's now 2022, more than five and a half years later. The case focused on the barrier, how it had been designed and if it had been fitted correctly. It was one metre tall two metres wide and weighed about 17 stone. It was fixed with just two small screws which in court was described as being more suited to hanging a picture with. In this CCTV footage, you can see the barrier wobbling in the days before Caden's death. During sentencing today, the judge said it should have been obvious to those designing, manufacturing and installing that the barrier could pose a significant risk if not fixed securely. It was installed in 29 flagship stores across the UK. One had already fallen and broke a customer's foot. Another had fractured a young girl's skull. And yet Arcadia had failed to investigate these properly. Earlier, I spoke to Caden's parents just after the sentencing. They told me that no fine would bring their boy back. You probably wouldn't have found a happier little boy. Hmm. He gave the best hugs you could ever imagine. Um, there was nothing better than sitting sitting down on the sofa and the first thing he would do is come up, cuddle right into you and sit and watch a movie over and over again. That was his best, that was him at his best. However, every Saturday morning, he would be the first one in the park. It would be half past eight and he'd want to be outside. He liked to be outside doing stuff. He liked roller skating, he liked his bike, anything like climbing. It's been more than five and a half years since mm -hmm. that awful, awful day and only now you're just starting to get some sort of justice. I mean, what have those five and a half years been like? <sighs> Stressful. Mm. It's been a long, long haul, different courts, different, um, different weeks, different days coming through and having to deal with that for five and a half years is stressful in all families mm -hmm. but it's an emotional day today it's it's finally come to an end for the courts but we still have to live with it for the rest of our lives yeah mm -hmm. that's the whole thing we got you've got some sort of justice but the fact is that Caden hasn't been here didn't celebrate his 11th his 12th 13th 14th even his 16th birthday this year so when we come back to court I mean we actually sat in court on Caden's 16th birthday. And then to hear people not kind of, not snake out of it, but almost point the blame at everybody else, which we knew they were gonna do. There was gonna be sloping shoulders. And today it was just nice for the judge to say, actually, you are at fault, you are accountable. And hopefully this now will be a, will be a deterrent for any other company, for people to take it a bit more seriously. Yeah, that's what we want. So there's no more families like us out there without, the, without their son. Natalie, it has been a long wait for the family. The sentencing for this wasn't straightforward, was it? 
No, it wasn't. Many people will know that Topshop and Arcadia are both in liquidation, as is Stoneforce, the company that fitted the barriers. They were fined just £1,000. What this means is that all of the fines would have been much higher if they had have been, still been operating. Reading Council, who took them all to court, released a statement earlier saying they were disappointed by this, but that they hope today's sentencing sends out a clear message to all retailers. Natalie in Reading, thank you. Now, not only are women twice as likely to suffer from asthma than men, women who have the condition are far more likely to experience attacks and die from it. Now, the University of Oxford is carrying out research to find out why the condition affects women differently. It's hoped the findings will be used to develop new ways to treat the condition. Wesley Smith has our report. Vicky Sargent, who lives near Bicester in Oxfordshire, has lived with an asthma diagnosis since she was 19. And it was a serious impediment at a time she had hoped to be living life to the full. Because of the illness that I have, I lost my sense of smell and taste um, for 10 years. I was um, having lots of trouble um, breathing properly and, and particularly breathing at night. So I'd be up in the middle of the night coughing a lot um, and it was almost like having a, a permanent cold. But Vicky's life was turned around when she was invited to participate in the trial of a new drug in Oxford. And I happened to get onto a drugs trial for a drug called Dupilumab, um, which I now take and have been taking for about four and a half years. Um, and my asthma symptoms are negligible now. It's an injection every two weeks. That's all I have to do. There are many factors which can exacerbate asthma and cause life-threatening breathing problems for sufferers. Pollution is said to be a major reason, but even changes in weather. For Vicky, it was caused by a chronic inflammatory disorder of her sinuses and lungs. But what she didn't know was that her gender made her more likely to be asthmatic. A research team from Oxford's Biomedical Research Centre has now been given a grant to discover why women are twice as likely to die from asthma as men. So asthma is massive. It affects 1 in 12 adults in the UK. That's 5.4 million people. And uh, each day in the UK, people are still dying of asthma. The immune system is different in men and women. We saw that with COVID, where men were twice as likely to die as women uh, due to a different immune response to the viruses. Viruses play a big role in asthma, and we think that women might be responding differently with a different immune response to men. We hope that we might be able to find some drugs which are already on the shelf, which we could use, perhaps different uses of hormones or something, to be able to treat women's asthma sooner rather than later. Research made all the difference to Vicky. It's hoped the findings here will now save the lives of many more asthmatic women and men. Wesley Smith, ITV News, near Bicester. South Central ambulance workers could go on strike over a dispute in pay and working conditions. The GMB union says it will ask members whether they should take industrial action in a ballot which starts on the 24th of October. Any potential walkouts could take place before Christmas. You're watching ITV News Meridian in the Thames Valley. Thank you for watching us coming up. An adventure with a difference, the dad's taking on the ultimate test of body and mind to raise money for prostate cancer. And Autumn Splendour, we take a look around the spectacular gardens at Mottisfont. For more news, please head to our website, itv.com forward slash meridian. You can call us, the number's on your screen now. It's 0808 1010 095. And remember, you can also follow us. That's on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Now we have a new uh, Chancellor, the MP for South West Surrey, Jeremy Hunt. It follows Kwasi Kwarteng's sacking earlier today and the market chaos that followed the mini-budget. The Prime Minister said during a press conference the country is facing a difficult situation and that she was acting decisively today to ensure our country's economic stability. Well, our political correspondent Phil Hornby is in Westminster. Phil, and what's been another dramatic day, really? Really extraordinary, Matt. Tonight we have a Prime Minister clinging to power, just one Chancellor, Kwasi Karteng, fired, a new Chancellor appointed, the MP for South West Surrey. Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor is somebody who shares my desire for a high growth, low tax economy. But we recognise because of current market issues, we have to deliver the mission in a different way. 
And soon after that very short news conference, the new Chancellor arrived at Downing Street, Jeremy Hunt, with perhaps the most difficult job in Britain. We've been talking to people in Downing Street, in Farnham, in his constituency, to find out what people there make of him. I know Jeremy Hunt, uh, and I've met him a few times, and he's done a very good job for us. And uh, I see no reason why he shouldn't do a very good job for the country. He's quite a decent geezer, he's a normal bloke, and um, I think he should go further. I think probably the best thing he can do is just make a decision and stick to it. Um, no more like just like jumping around and like not knowing, because it just makes people not trust them. We pay a lot of money really here, like you know, rent, tax, council tax, and now the uh, energy is getting very high. Maybe they can help us with this. Tonight, Liz Trust supporters like the Christchurch MP Christopher Chope say they're in despair at yet more U-turns. Liz Trust opponents in the Tory party say she'll be out before you know it. OK, Phil, for the time being, thank you very much. It has been quite a day politically and the ITV Evening News continues here at 6.30 with more Lucrezia Millerini. Coming up, the Prime Minister sacks her Chancellor and performs another budget U-turn. Kwasi Kwarteng was in his job for just 38 days and tonight he is replaced by Jeremy Hunt. I have acted decisively today because my priority is ensuring our country's economic stability. Well, Liz Truss also scrapped the planned corporation tax cut, but how has it gone down with MPs and does it shore up her position? Also ahead, what does the future hold for Royal Mail with 10,000 jobs to be axed? Plus the biggest and best yet, the World Cup, set to transform Rugby League. Join me at 6.30. Now, we all know the health benefits of walking, but new academic research shows that it can also significantly improve a child's mood, concentration and memory, enhancing their ability to learn while making their teacher's life easier. Well, that's why thousands of school children now take part in the Daily Mile. It's just 15 minutes of running, walking or wheeling every day. We've been to Western Park Primary in Southampton to find out why the Daily Mile is now firmly fixed on their timetable burning off some of that pent-up energy from sitting in lessons. These children at Western Park Primary in Southampton are embracing the chance to get outside and engage their legs as well as their mind. It helps me clear my mind and if I'm stressed it helps me calm down. And it just, it's a fun activity to do when at break time or lunch time. What I enjoy is like it burns off my energy and it um makes me concentrate more on my learning, yeah. When we get inside of the classroom, um, we drink water so then we can stay hydrated after a very long run. It's free, inclusive and come rain, wind or sunshine, they're raring to go. Some running as fast as they can, others enjoying a more leisurely stroll. And it's not just the children who are getting stuck in. The children really enjoy the daily exercise, the daily chance to come out, get their heart rate pounding. And we find it really helps them with their afternoon learning when they transition back into the classroom. They've had a chance to burn off some energy, their blood is pumping, their brains are ready to go again. So they find it really beneficial. It's all part of a national initiative. We're going to go outside and you'll be running, jogging or walking for about 15 minutes. At a time when many schools are still catching up after the pandemic, new research has found it significantly improves the child's mood, concentration and memory. We looked at the long-term impact of taking part in the Daily Mail and we found that those children who'd been doing it for a longer period of time were fitter. Um, and we also found that those who'd recently started taking part, um, their visual spatial memory, so a particular type of memory, was better than those who weren't taking part at all. So we again looked at this longer term. So we see that it's good for our health and it's good for our concentration. There are around 3 million children taking part across 87 countries, with more joining every day. Jogging, walking or wheeling to 10 million children over the next 10 years. Chloe Oliver, ITV News. Well, let's stay on the sporting theme. Andrew joins us in the studio. He's, he's done his daily mile around the office. We saw him earlier, getting Absolutely. ready for a busy weekend. Yeah, I, I'm already exhausted. But, but you're actually right. It's <laughs> such a busy weekend ahead. 
No time to waste. Brighton playing Brentford in the Premier League tonight at 8 o'clock. Roberto De Zerbi looking for his first win as manager. Someone who's had no problems on that front is Bournemouth's interim manager, Gary O'Neill. He's looking to continue his fantastic unbeaten run when the Cherries travel to Fulham tomorrow, but says he's still not thinking about taking the job on full time. Yeah, we're five unbeaten. Um, good win last weekend, but I, I know how quickly it can change. I know how fine the margins are. We need to keep our levels. We can't we can't let things slide even one or two percent. I think it will affect results at this level. The, the level is so high that we're fully focused on the, the next game. Southampton play on Sunday. Manager Ralph Hasenhutl under pressure to get a result against West Ham. In the Football League, Reading are looking to bounce back from last week's defeat against QPR when they host West Brom tomorrow. The Royals two points off top spot. All our Football League sides play at three o'clock tomorrow, apart from Portsmouth, who have to wait until Monday night when they visit Charlton. Now, this weekend, 25,000 people will take part in the Great South Run in Portsmouth. As well as the main 10-mile event on Sunday, there are mini-runs tomorrow. And for many, just arriving at the start line is an achievement in itself. As Sarah Gon has been finding out. Zero accounting software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. When Dale Moffat arrives at the Great South start line, it'll be a hugely symbolic moment. 30-year-old Dale last completed the 10-mile race in 2019, finishing in an hour and 22 minutes. Since then, so much has changed. Left with a spinal injury after a road traffic accident on New Year's Day in 2021 whilst out jogging, Dale will this year compete in his special racing wheelchair. It took me a long time, I was in hospital for two and a half months and then it took a long time to recover and get into a place where I could do sport again and then I since in November last year picked up wheelchair racing um, and so I've been training from, from nothing at all all the way up to the Great South Run now. Dale is raising funds for spinal research. He wants to beat the time in which he ran the race, all testament to the positivity with which he has faced his new life. Since his injury, Dale has skied, sailed the iconic Round the Island race and married his wife, Rachel. Before my injury, I've been called annoyingly positive and so certain friends weren't too worried. And I, I have been very, very positive in the way I've gone about life since and I've done many other different activities as well. So I just keep myself as busy as possible and, and take life to the fullest. And while Dale won't line up to compete until Sunday, many will enjoy their own special race day on Saturday, including three-year-old Rudy Bingham, who will take part in the annual mini-run. Mum Fiona will also complete 10 miles on Sunday. Rudy has cerebral palsy and money raised will help fund a vital operation to support his mobility and decrease his pain. We are doing the big run and the little run, aren't we, Rudy, to raise money for Rudy so he is having a spinal operation next year to help him with the tone in his legs to make walking easier and we're doing it with loads of friends aren't we and family and it's really exciting and among those friends will be Finn Evans and his mum Jenny who took part themselves back in 2019 Fiona, a respiratory physiotherapist who worked on Portsmouth's Covid wards and now supports those with long Covid says she's humbled by the support of the city she calls home. I imagine it'll be a bit of an emotional moment when you're at that start line together. It's going to be a really emotional weekend, I think, because this is our first big event that we've done for Rudy. Um, and it's a culmination of a lot of, a lot of things that have been going on, like the diagnosis through to getting the OK for the operation. But what's been amazing is just knowing that we've got such a huge support around us. So, and in our home city as well, it'd be amazing knowing that we're running with everyone around us, supporting us in our, on our home turf, as it were. So yeah, it'll be a really, really special weekend, but very emotional. It's also the Oxford Half Marathon on Sunday. So good luck to everyone pounding the pavements this weekend. Good luck and we'll have weather coming up for them soon too. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, some more inspirational people now because three dads from Sussex are preparing to row the Atlantic Ocean as part of a race. It's to raise money for prostate cancer charities. Matt Garman's father died of the disease and he and his two friends, Neil and Steve, will make the 3,000 mile journey over six weeks. But the trio are under no illusion about how tough it's going to be with sleep deprivation, hallucinations and hunger, just some of the tests they well could face. They've been talking to Malcolm Shaw. For 40 days and 40 nights, this slender boat will be home to three dads as they take on the biggest challenge of their lives, an attempt to row 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean. Solar panels run navigation aids, while other onboard equipment makes seawater drinkable. When the boat's out of the water, it always looks uh, quite big. Um, when it's in the water with three men on it, it looks incredibly small. People say the same when they see us off um, New Haven, where we've been training in Seaford. They say it's an incredibly small boat. Uh, it is. Th it, there's no luxury on the boat whatsoever. It's there to serve a purpose, to get us from A to B. Matt Garman and Neil Firminger, both from Seaford, are in their 50s, but undaunted by what they're taking on after three years of planning and training. Today their boat was on show outside the foundry in Eastbourne, where they're also giving a talk about their challenge. I've been out on an experience day with the guys and it is humbling. I spent six hours with the guys and I couldn't stop talking, I couldn't stop asking questions. It's incredibly interesting, it's, it's humbling, it's physical. Matt lost his father to prostate cancer during lockdown. The Atlantic Crossing will raise money for two charities close to his heart, Prostate Cancer UK and We Only Live Once, based in Seaford. In the past, it's been, a, it's been a race and an event that's been kind of afforded to professionals and Olympians and those sorts of people. Um, but we just thought, well, why not? We've all challenged ourselves. We've all done some, some quite large endurance events. Um, but, yeah, no, we, 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 we're totally up for the challenge. The gruelling schedule will see the three friends take turns to grab food and sleep in between long shifts on the oars day and night. They'll set off from the Canary Islands at the beginning of December, hoping the trade winds will help them reach Antigua six weeks later. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Eastbourne. Now the leaves are beginning to fall. We've had some chillier nights and misty mornings. It's safe to say autumn is here. And of course, with changing seasons comes the changing landscapes. Rich oranges, yellow, rust colours creating beautiful displays. Absolutely beautiful. And one place which is spectacular at this time of year is National Trust Estate Mottisfont in Hampshire. We sent Rachel Hepworth to take a look around. Well, Mottisfont is of course world famous for its roses during the late spring and early summer, but it's also justifiably proud of the tremendous display that it puts on in the autumn as well. The reds and the golds just starting to peep through, it's looking beautiful in this idyllic spot alongside the River Test. Well, some of the most spectacular trees at the moment are these London plains, and this one is one of the biggest and oldest in the whole country. So what better place to speak to the Trust's gardens and parks expert, uh, Emma McNamara. Emma, what conditions make for a really good autumn display? Um, a really good autumn display is caused by um, really lovely uh, bright days, uh, good sunlight, and then the evenings um, and nights cooling down, but not getting below sort of two degrees. That's really the best conditions. And what kind of summer has it been? I know it was very dry, wasn't it? Has that made a difference? Uh, we did have a very dry summer, which caused a bit of false autumn where the leaves uh, fell from the trees because they were slightly stressed by the lack of water. But um, they've, a lot of them have bounced back. And have people got long to go and enjoy this autumn colour? And, and if so, where are the best places to go locally? Um, I think we've got a good few weeks yet of autumn colour. Um, so people have got time to come, especially to Mottisfont, to see the plane trees. But also there are some lovely spots, so Basildon Park, Grays Court um, near Henley. They're wonderful. And Hewenden Manor, just outside High Wycombe, is a good spot for tree colour. Fantastic. Well, lots of places to choose from. And while we're focusing on autumn outside the house, Inside, there's a stark reminder that winter is on the way because there's an exhibition uh, featuring the artwork of Narnia, where, of course, famously it was always winter, but never Christmas. Now, this is the only exhibition celebrating the centenary of Pauline Baines, who created the illustrations for C.S. Lewis's original books, and many believe that she deserves to be better known. It's an absolute shame because, as you can see, her, her talent is, is incredible um, as an illustrator, but I believe at that time when she was produ producing these illustrations 
um, there was a lot of male talent around who kind of domineered the illustrations for many um, books and children's books in particular as well. Unfortunately, she just never got that prominence and hence the reason in her centenary year we brought all of her works together. So lots to enjoy here at Mottis Font, whatever the weather. And hopefully you've been inspired to go out and find a little bit of autumn colour for yourself. Beautiful. A reminder there of just how beautiful nature can be. Pips is here to talk about the weather. And a reminder tonight of how, how powerful nature can be, because we're talking about a bit of an anniversary. Yeah, that's right. So this weekend will mark the 35th anniversary of sorts of the great storm of 1987. Unforgettable, devastating for some, but it did provide a huge catalyst for some massive improvements in terms of the way we forecast things like that and how we communicate it. So firstly, a lot of investment into the technology behind the, uh, the weather forecast. Um, to put it into context, the average smartphone these days is five times more powerful than the Met Office supercomputer was back in 1987. Just incredible. Fast forward to today and the UK's Met Office own one of the most powerful weather-related supercomputers in the world. Uh, secondly, we developed the National Severe Weather Warning Service. We're familiar with the yellow, amber and red warnings. Not only useful for providing information on the weather, but what sort of impact it'll have. And more recently, since 2015, we've been naming the storms before they've happened rather than after. Again, really much more easy to keep tabs on a name storm if you're following it online, on social media, if it's got a name. We remember all those pictures. Like, yes. You know, 35 yeah. years ago, can't believe it. But the name storms, you know, that's something that we kind of begin to hear about this time of year. Yeah, that's right. So the UK storm season starts on the 1st of September. We're still waiting for the first one. This year it will be Anthony, but we might be waiting a little while longer. Last year, our wind didn't arrive on our shores until later late November. Well, let's hope that we don't get um, Anthony, yeah. whatever his name is, coming yeah. here too yeah. soon. We don't want because, him. No. And South, Great South Run, all good for that? Yeah, all good for the Great South Run. Yes, in fact, some of the best weather of the weekend will be on Sunday morning. Dry, fairly bright, and the wind's nice and light for that last couple of miles back along the seafront. OK, <laughs> let's get your full <laughs> forecast now. Here's our pip. Feels like home. Whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. A bit of a mixed picture this weekend then. For Saturday, I suspect it'll be quite breezy and we'll have some rain on and off at times. But for Sunday, arguably the better of the two days. Hopefully a bit drier and brighter all round. Out there at the moment, we've lost earlier rain and under clear skies, we're seeing some mist patches developing. But as the night wears on, we will see a bit more cloud moving in from the west and then further outbreaks of rain. Of course, with all of that, it will be a pretty mild night and temperatures for many of us will stay up in double figures. So a bit dull and damp in initially tomorrow morning but once the early rain clears some lovely sunshine coming through and then later in the day you guessed it more in the way of cloud and outbreaks of rain moving in from the west and some of this rain could perhaps be a little on the heavier side temperature wise still looking mild on the face of it high 16 17 celsius but it will be pretty breezy tomorrow and that will make it feel somewhat fresher High tides for tomorrow then for Brighton there just before three in the morning and just after three in the afternoon. Beyond that then through Saturday evening and into Sunday that next front clears away southeastwards and we'll start to see a little ridge of high pressure building in from the near continent. So for Sunday morning for those great south runners it's looking pretty quiet. Light winds as well. Perhaps some rain later in the day but that will again clear through overnight. A drier start to the new week but all looking a little more changeable again thereafter. Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Good luck for the Oxford Half and, of course, the Great South Run. In just a moment here, the ITV Evening News continues with Lucrezia Minerini. That's just about it from us, though, for this evening. Stacey's back with the latest update just after half past ten. But from the team, have a fantastic weekend. Happy weekend. See you Monday. Bye-bye.